Hello everyone, welcome back to Math with Allison. Today we're continuing our series on integration, so we're gonna be talking about properties of definite integrals with lots of pictures to come. So let's go ahead and dive into it. I have this from the previous video. We have a function along with the corresponding areas. So let's go ahead and revisit what it means to take the definite integral. We are finding the area between the function and the x-axis. So when we're taking the definite integral from a to b, we are finding this first little area. And so this is equal to a value of 12. But when we're working from b to c, we are now below the x-axis, which means we have a negative area of negative 10. Now, if we go from a to c, that means we need to add those two areas together. So here we get a value of 2. And if we work from b to d, that means we need to add negative 10 plus 8, which is equal to negative 2. So now that we revisited what definite integrals are, let's go ahead and go through their properties. So property number one, when we integrate from a to a, we're gonna have a value of zero. So let's go ahead and talk about why that is. That would be like we're literally just integrating this point, we're finding the area beneath that point, which would look something like this. So when we're finding the area, it's still length times height. So here we have a height of f of a, but what is our length? The length is equal to zero. When you have zero times f of a, you get zero. So the integral or the area under a point is equal to zero. Let's move on to the second property. Here when we switch the bounds, so first we're integrating from a to b of f of x dx. When we switch those, it makes it negative. So let's go ahead and talk about what that means. First we have the integral of one to two of two x dx. When we integrate it, we get x squared from one to two. I'm gonna plug in my upper, so I get two squared minus one squared. That is equal to four minus one, which is equal to three. Let's see what happens when we switch those bounds. So now we have x squared evaluated from two up to one. This is equal to one squared minus two squared, which is equal to one minus, ooh, I said the answer, four, which is equal to negative three. So notice how it makes it negative, and we're gonna go ahead and talk about why. So we're going to see our function right here, and when we integrate from 1 to 2, it's going to be that shaded area. When we're working left to right, our length is equal to positive 1, and our height is going to be whatever the function is equal to. When we're working backwards, our height doesn't change at all, but now we're going from 2 to 1. So we have a length equal to negative 1. So that's what happens when we change the bounds. Let's move on to the third property here. When we have two functions being added or subtracted, we can separate those into two separate integrals. That's the same thing for indefinite integrals, but now we could just get to apply it to finding the area under the curve. So let's go ahead and see this in action. We have the integral of zero to pi of one plus cosine of x dx. We are gonna go ahead and split this up. So first I have the integral of zero to pi of one in terms of x, and we're gonna add on the integral from zero to pi of cosine of x in terms of x. Now let's go ahead and find these antiderivatives. So first we get x from zero to pi plus sine of x from zero to pi as well. Now we can plug these in, upper minus lower, that whole thing. So first we get pi minus zero. And now when I plug in my upper, I get sine of pi minus sine of zero. And actually these are almost all equal to zero. So that's zero, that's zero, that's zero, except this pi. So here we get the area under this curve is equal to pi. So here I have the function actually mapped out, and we found that this area all down here is equal to pi. Now let's go ahead and take a look when I separate these two out. So remember, we have the integral of one and we have the integral of cosine. So I have those both mapped out right here. Let's go ahead and talk about the integral of cosine first. So first we have this little area, and we also have this little area down here. These two areas are gonna cancel each other out. This is equal to a negative value, and this is equal to a positive value, but they're symmetric. They're exactly the same. And so when you add those two areas together, we get an area of zero. So we actually get to ignore the area of cosine. So now that we're ignoring the area of cosine, let's talk about the area of one. When we calculate this area, we have a height of one, but we have a length of pi. So here our area is equal to one times pi which is equal to pi, and we get the exact same solution. So that's why we're able to split up the functions. Let's go on to the fourth property here. When we have a scalar multiple, so we have the c value right here, we can bring the scalar multiple out. So this is also the same for indefinite integrals, but it also applies to area. Here we have the integral from zero of two of two x dx. So in this integral, we have the scalar multiple of two, which means we can bring out that value of two. So zero to two of x dx. 
So here we get 2, and we take the antiderivative. So we, I get x squared divided by 2 from 0 to 2. So here I'm going to do upper minus lower. So I get 2 squared divided by 2 minus 0 squared divided by 2. This is going to be equal to 2 times 4 divided by 2 minus 0. And that is going to be equal to 2 times 2, which is equal to 4. Now, if we were to calculate this without bringing out that value of 2, we would just get the antiderivative is equal to x squared from 0 to 2. When we plug that in, we get 2 squared minus 0 squared, which is equal to 4. So let's go ahead and take a look at both of these antiderivatives. So first we have f of x is equal to 2x, and we found the area under the curve was equal to 4. Now here we have the function of x, which is what we did right here. We just took the antiderivative of x. Let's go ahead and calculate this area. This is going to be equal to 1 half the base, which is 2, and the height, which is 2, which is equal to value of 2. But we're taking two of these integrals, so I'm taking two of the triangles. So I'm going to go ahead and multiply my area by 2, and here I get a value of 4. So it's like I'm taking two of those little triangles and I'm fitting it into the big triangle, which is why we're allowed to pull out the scalar multiple. You don't always have to, like if you like just taking the straight antiderivative, that's totally fine. The scalar multiples just hang out, but that's what it looks like graphically. Okay, we have one more property here, and this property says that when we're taking the antiderivative, we can split it into multiple if we take a value between a and b. So c in this case is going to be between a and b. So let's go ahead and talk about what that means. Here we have the integral from 0 to pi of sine of x dx. So I went ahead and already graphed this out, and we can see the blue area is going to be the area that we're looking for. What this is saying is I could cut this in half, so I'm going to go ahead and take this at pi over 2, and I'm going to calculate these areas separately. So first I'm going to take the integral of 0 to pi over 2 of sine of x dx, and I'm going to go ahead and add on this other area. Here the antiderivative of sine is equal to negative cosine of x, and we're evaluating this first one between 0 and pi over 2, and then we're adding on negative cosine of x, and this one's being evaluated from pi over 2 all the way up to pi. So let's go ahead and calculate this out. When I plug in my upper, we get that whole thing, and here we get cosine of pi over 2 is always going to be 0. So these ones get to go away, very nice. And now I just have to worry about cosine of 0, as we can see those in turn into a positive, minus cosine of pi. So this is equal to 1 minus negative 1, which is equal to value of 2. So now let's go ahead and actually calculate that out with the original integral, because this should also equal a value of 2. And here we also got a value of 2. So you can split up the integrals any way you want to, so long as the function is continuous. So that's all I have for us today. If you enjoyed this video, I have many more like it, so make sure to check out my playlist. They're linked down below. Otherwise, please give this video a thumbs up and comment other problems or topics you'd like to see done. Thanks for watching.